and it is back to school time again. Many of you are probably have mixed emotions about it. Some of you may be a little sad that summer is over. Some of you already started going to school. Most of you are starting school tomorrow. Well, as a student, you may feel nervous or a little scared about going back to school because of this new normal. And also all the things that you will have to face in school or in your house because you're doing homeschool or you're doing school virtually. So if you are going to be in school in person, you must be very careful that you must always wear your masks, face shield, wash your hands more often, and also keep social distancing. If you will do school virtually, you must have a good internet connection a reliable computer. And of course, you have to wash your hands too. And you will also have uh, new teachers, some new friends. And some of you may even be going to a new school. On the first day of school, the teacher will probably ask some questions to see how much you already know. And when the teacher asks, question to which you know the answer, you might wave your hand excitedly in the air and say, Oh, I know, teacher, I know, I know. It is a great feeling when you know the answer, isn't it? It sure helps to take away those back to school jitters. In our Bible lesson today, the disciples are going back to school. And can you guess their teacher is? Right, Jesus is their teacher. And Jesus often took his disciples aside to teach them important lessons about the kingdom of God. When Jesus lived on earth, he went around helping people too. He fed the hungry, he healed the sick, and made the blind to see and the lame to walk. After Jesus healed someone, it was not unusual to hear someone in the crowd ask, Who is this man? Jesus heard people asking questions, and he also heard the answers that people gave. You know, Jesus did not wear anything special to show who he was. So just looking at Jesus, he might have seemed to be like anyone else of his day. And as you might imagine, there was a lot of confusion about who Jesus really was. And this was one of those days. Jesus began his lesson that day by asking his disciples a question. I guess all of us here see ourselves as students of Jesus. In other words, his followers and Jesus being our personal tutor through the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, I believe Jesus is interested in the viewpoints people have about him, what people say about him. So let me ask you these questions. Do you recognize Jesus as the Messiah? Do you therefore recognize and accept Jesus in your life as your savior? Do you recognize and accept him in your accept him as your anointed king? The one who wants to rule over your life. What is however very important to him is our personal understanding of who Jesus is. That's why the title of my sermon is, Who is Jesus to you? I believe Jesus is asking each of us the same question that he asked his disciples centuries ago. Who do you say I am? So today I have three points for you. 
So let's start in the first point. We'll be talking about verses 13 and 14 from Matthew 16. So let's start with verse 13a. Now when Jesus came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi. You know, Caesarea Philippi is near Mount Hermon. It's 25 miles, or 40 kilometers, north of the Sea of Galilee. It is at the boundary of the Gentile world and is primarily a Gentile city. In earlier times, it was known for the worship of Baal and Pan. In Jesus' day, it had a temple to Caesar. Jesus seems to go there to escape the Galilean crowd so that he might prepare his disciples for his journey to Jerusalem, which will begin at John chapter 19, verse 1, a journey that will end in Jesus' death and resurrection. And in verse 13b, who, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, Jesus chooses this gentle place to reveal himself more completely to his disciples, perhaps giving as a hint of the concern for the whole world that will make us explicit in the Great Commission. You know our Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20? So rather than telling the disciples his identity, Jesus asking his, this asks his disciples who people believe the Son of Man to be. Son of Man is a title Jesus most often uses to identify himself. The title Son of Man comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, where the Ancient of Days, or God, gave to the one, like a son of man, dominion and glory and the kingdom that all the apostles, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Because of its inclusive language agenda, the NRSV, or New Revised Standard Version, translates the phrase in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 as human being rather than son of man. That is an especially unfortunate translation given the significance of the title, son of man. Well, the phrase in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 is bar inas. The word bar is Hebrew for son, and Enos is Hebrew for man. So the title son of man has the advantage of having none of the material of none of militaristic connotations associated with the title Messiah. People expect the Messiah to raise an army to drive out the Romans and to reestablish the great Davidic kingdom. They have no such expectations regarding the Son of Man, Jesus' frequent use of the title in connection with his passion, suggests a veiled messianic title. And in verse 14, it says, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You know, the disciples, not just Peter, tell Jesus that people think of him as the following. First, John the Baptist, who was murdered by Herod. John was such a powerful presence that the people would not be surprised to see him again. Indeed, Hero thinks that Jesus might be a resurrected John. Secondly, the prophet Jer Elijah, the workers of miracles, who was expected to reappear before the great and terrible day of Yahweh comes 
You can read that from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5. Thirdly, the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who had opposed the religious leaders in Jerusalem and had predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And fourthly, the last, or one of the other prophets. It is clear that people think well of Jesus and have pegged him as a prophet. However, when they try to identify him, they do so in terms of past prophets. But Jesus is more than a prophet. He is the Christos, the Christ, the anointed one of God. It is interesting to know that people's opinions of Jesus. But Jesus' first question simply prepares the disciples for his second all-important question. Which brings us to my second point. Verses 15 to 17 is my second point. So we'll start with verse 15. Jesus asks, but who do you say I am? In verse 13, Jesus told his disciples that he is the son of man. That he asks what they believe about him. When Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? You is both empathic and plural. He addresses this question to the disciples at large, rather than to Peter only. The people are free to believe whatever they want about Jesus, but Jesus has been carefully preparing these disciples to carry on his work. They have heard his teaching and his teachings and witnessed his miracles. What they think of him is critical. How we answer this question is also critical. Uncertainty equates to unbelief at this point. To be Christian means believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Anything else is less than Christian. And in verse 16a, Simon Peter answered, you know, Peter is the usual spokesman for the disciples. And in verse 16b, he said, You are the Christ, or Christos. Christos means anointed, or the anointed one. Israel anointed people with oil to set them apart for a special role, such as a prophet, priest, or king. Anointing indicated not only that God had chosen this person, but also that God would give this person the ability to fulfill the role. But when Peter said, you are the Christ, he was going one step further, a giant step. Israel had for many years been looking for God to send a savior, someone like King David of old who had led Israel to greatness. Israel was looking for God to send a Messiah to do that again, to make Israel great again, to save Israel from oppressors such as Rome, who ruled Israel during Jesus' lifetime. When Peter said, you are the Christ, he was saying, you are the Savior for whom we have waited for centuries. You are the one sent from God to save us. You know, the people, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I think the other disciples may have cheered Peter. And they're like, yes, good job, Peter. Good answer, good answer. Well, in the New Testament accounts of Jesus' baptism, it doesn't include the word anoint. Some scholars think of his baptism as his anointing. You can find it in Luke chapter 7, verse 46. The New Testament speaks of Jesus 
as filling the three roles for which anointing was appropriate, prophet, priest, and king. So in prophet, you can read that in Matthew chapter 21, verse 11, and John chapter 6, verse 14, and chapter 7 to 40. While in priest, uh, it's in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, and chapter 8, verse 1. And king is in Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, and 37, 42, and from the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 14, chapter 19 to 16. Okay, so we are not surprised to hear that Jesus is the Christ. This gospel began with the words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And Matthew has used the word Christ several times by now. In chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 11, verse 2. And we cannot know what the disciples thought when they first left everything to follow Jesus. Presumably, they have grown their understanding as they followed him day by day. And this, however, is the first time that a disciple has acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ. In verse 16, C, the Son of the living God. We first heard that Jesus is the Son of God at his baptism when God announced, This is my beloved Son. Matthew 3 17. Jesus has spoken of himself as Son. The disciples earlier called Jesus as the Son of God. When he walked across the water to their boat and stilled the storm. That's in Matthew 14, 33. You know, the living God contrasts with the lifeless idols that would dot the landscape in Caesarea Philippi. A statement like Peter's demands commitment. If he truly believes that Jesus is the Messiah, he will have to give his all to Jesus' service. And that is also true for us, brothers and sisters. So Jesus answered Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's in verse 17. You know, Bariona is an Aramaic transliterated into Greek. Bar means son, and Aeonas means Jonah. So Peter identified Jesus as the son of the living God. Now Jesus responds by acknowledging Simon as the son of Jonah, while extending to him his blessing. In the Gospel of John, Peter's father is identified as John rather than Jonah. So you can read that in John chapter 1 verse 42, 21 verse 15. Jesus calls him Simon, the name by which Simon's father would recognize him rather than the new name Peter that Jesus will give him into the next verse. Um, 17. Peter did not arrive at his insight by spiritual astuteness. God has given him this understanding of Jesus. Peter's insight comes by revelation, not deduction. His understanding is a gift from God. So my third and last point, verses 18 to 20. Now in verse 18, it says, Peter, and on this rock I will build my assembly, and the gates of Hades will not prevent, prevail against it. 
The scriptures refers to God as a rock. You can find it in Genesis, in Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel, and in Psalms. Isaiah also refers to Abraham and Sarah as a rock. It says in Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 to 2, Look to the rock you were cut from, and to the hold of the pit you were dug from. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. So given these associations, Jesus does great honor to Peter when he identifies him as a rock. He also lays on him a heavy burden of responsibility. In verse 18b, and on this rock. So you might be questioning, what rock? Is it the reality that Jesus is the Son of God? Or the faith that Peter exhibits when he makes this confession? Is the rock Peter himself? You know, Catholics and Protestants have divided sharply in their inter interpretation of these words. Catholics understand them to establish Peter as the rock upon which Jesus will build his church. They also understand Peter to have been the first bishop of Rome and the first of an unbroken succession of popes. A traditional Protestant interpretation is that the rock is Peter's confession and the reali reality that stands behind it, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Protestants point to the distinction between the two rocks that Jesus mentions. You are Peter. Petros. It's masculine, meaning a stone, a rock. And on this rock, it's Petra, feminine, conveying the idea of a rock foundation. I will build my ecclesia, my church. Protestants have understood Jesus to be distinguishing between the rock that is Peter and the rock upon which he will build his church. However, while the New Testament was written in Greek, Jesus almost certainly used the Aramaic word, Cephas, which lends itself less well to that kind of distinction. There has been some movement toward the center in more recent years, but Protestants are willing to acknowledge Peter's special place in the life of the early church, but do not believe that Peter was the first pope. So personally, I find it significant that Peter's leadership in the church was ascendant through the book of Acts chapter 12. After which we hear from him only once in Acts chapter 15 verse 7. Beginning with Acts 13, Paul is ascendant. Was that because Peter had died? Well, not likely. We believe that he traveled to Rome where he was martyred, 60 to 64 AD. A full decade after the events of Acts chapter 12. So Protestants point out that Jesus offers his blessing to Peter, but with no suggestion that the blessings can be passed on or that any succession is intended. So they point out five, five things. First, they point out that Peter, the rock, almost immediately becomes Peter, the stumbling block. They also said that the granting of authority to Simon Peter is obviously symbolic for all the apostles. For elsewhere in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, and in John chapter 20, verse 23, this bestowal of power is on all of them. Thirdly, they note Jesus' prohibition against giving to the people honors that belong rightfully to the Father and the Son. 
they point to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, which say, For no one can, can lay any other foundation than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And lastly, they note that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. You can read that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. In that verse, apostles and prophets are plural. So the foundation is not limited to Peter. In verse 18c, I will build my assembly, or ecclesia. Ecclesia is a combination of ek, which means out, and kaleo, which is called. So it means called out. Ecclesia can refer to any assembly, but Jesus' ecclesia is the church. It is Jesus who builds the church. The church belongs to him. The apostles and the other Christians play supporting roles, and those roles are important. However, Jesus has the lead role. The word church is a stumbling block to some scholars who rightly point out that there was no church or ecclesia at that time, that Jesus spoke these words. However, Jesus would surely have a vision of the community of believers that would, rise, would arise after his ascension. In verse 18, verse verse 18 D, it says, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You know, Hades is the abode of the dead, but it is also a metaphor for the demonic. Jesus' words assure us that while the church will endure repeated assaults by the powers of evil, it will prevail in the end. The gates of Hades prevent those inside from getting out and those outside from breaking in. Jesus will break that power by his own resurrection, which will be the first fruits of the many faithful who will be raised from the dead. You can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. The gates of Hades will not withstand Christ's resurrection assault on them. The redeemed among the dead will rise again and stride confidently through the broken gates. In verse 19a, Jesus said, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The wording has its roots in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. I will place on Eliakim's shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. Eliakim thus became the steward of the house. He's responsible for opening the house in the morning and then closing it at night and controlling access to the royal presence. In his role as a gatekeeper, Peter will open the gates for 3,000 people at Pentecost. This is in Acts chapter 2. Although he will initially resist opening the gates to Gentiles, God will persuade him to admit the Gentile centurion. Acts 10. And Peter will become the spokesperson to the council of Jerusalem to keep the gates open to Gentiles. Acts 15. And in verse 19b, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you release on earth will have been released in heaven. So bind and release have to do with rulings regarding doctrine and ethical conduct. In Jewish usage, bind and release have to do with actions permitted 
and the actions prescribed. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus extends this authority to the whole group of disciples, saying, Mostly, certainly, I tell you, whatever things you bind on earth. So again, this is the place where Catholics and Protestants go separate ways. Catholics believe that Peter's authority passed from Peter to the papacy. Protestants emphasize the authority given to the group of disciples and believe that any unique authority given to Peter ended with his death. After Jesus' resurrection, he will tell the disciples, not Peter alone, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sin, they have been forgiven them. If you retain anyone's sins, they have been retained. So that's in John chapter 20, verses 22 to 23. So in our last verse, 20. Then he commanded the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Jesus, he was Jesus, the Christ. Jesus is not yet ready for the disciples to tell the world his secret. The world is not ready to hear the secret. And the disciples are not yet ready to reveal the secret accurately. They understand that Jesus is the Christ, but they understand messiahship in a conventional warrior king terms. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28, our gospel lesson for next week, Jesus will tell the disciples what to expect from his messiahship his death and resurrection. And Peter will protest mightily, prompting a sharp rebuke from Jesus. Jesus will not allow the disciples to reveal his messiahship that until they understand what that entails. They will not really understand until they see the resurrected Christ that will come soon enough. And Jesus will begin his journey to Jerusalem and the cross at John chapter 19, verse 1. In closing, the lesson that the disciples learned that day is just as important today as it was back then. Did you know that there are still many people today who don't know who Jesus is? They don't know what Peter knew. They don't know what you and I know. They don't know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You and I, brothers and sisters, must be ready with the answer. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Our confession should be, Jesus is the Messiah the only Savior who can save us from eternal separation from God. He is the King of Kings who wants to rule our lives. We must not only confess that, that truth, but also believe in and accept Him as our Savior and King. In addition, we must proclaim it loud and clear amidst the noise of political correctness. That Jesus is the Messiah, the only Savior for humankind, and the anointed King who wants to rule the hearts of everybody, both great and small. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, when people are searching for the answer to the question, who is Jesus? Help us to be ready with the answer. We pray that many will come to recognize you as their Messiah, as their Savior and King. Jesus, we confess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God.
the one in whose name we pray. Amen.